Hello, my name is John, and this is the Mask Face Journal, and this is what I've read this week. Green Arrow number 13, written by Benjamin Percy and art by Otto Schmidt. I've generally enjoyed this series, but this has to be said. Any book that uses the word mansplaining gets an automatic point deduction from the final tally. What's worse, it comes from one of the protagonists, and she uses it incorrectly. I usually try and keep politics out of these videos, but this was so glaring it had to be mentioned. Besides that shaky and completely unnecessary beginning, this is a pretty good issue. I feel that it's setting up the story and the different elements of the story really well. And it's really quite different from the last few story arcs. It's, it's kind of cozy. Justice League number 11, written by Brian Hitch and art by Neil Edwards. This whole story has been really stupid. At least it doesn't get any dumber in its conclusion. This issue is one big brawl between the Justice League and a bunch of villains. That's really what one would expect, but the reason for it is really weak. Also, why is Superman on the cover? He's not in the story at all. They basically went with the old Superman is away on a mission in space excuse from back in the day. Another thing, why is Amazo in this when he's not doing any of the things that Amazo does? Copy superhero abilities. He's pretty much just the Hulk in this. Justice League vs Suicide Squad number one written by Joshua Williamson and art by Jason Fabok. I did not hate this. Not at all. This could in fact shape up to be one quite decent mini. I kind of like the little touch that there's an introduction and narration blurb for every character for the benefits of new readers. There's one explaining who Batman is, one for Wonder Woman and Flash, etc. But the one for Harley Quinn just states that we already know exactly who she is. Thinking about it, that might actually be true. A new reader in this day and age might know who Harley Quinn is and have no idea who Batman is. That's kind of scary. Raven, number four, written by Marv Wolfman and art by Diogenes Neves. Not really sure what to say about this one. It almost feels like filler, but what use is a filler issue in a six issue mini? What I'm getting at is that almost every obstacle that was introduced in the last issue is being fairly quickly conquered in this one, while no progress is being made in stopping or even understanding the main problem that is the giant magical energy sphere that keeps absorbing the population of San Francisco. What keeps me from judging this as complete filler is that there is some internal struggle with Raven and her father, Trigon, that might be important to the overall story. Then again, it could just be introducing that dynamic to people unfamiliar with that character. Star Trek Green Lantern number one, written by Mike Johnson and art by Angel Hernandez. The previous Star Trek Green Lantern crossover, The Spectrum Wars, was a pleasant surprise when it came out, as it was not only really good read, but it also subverted expectations by not resetting the status quo at the end. That opened the possibility for a sequel, and this is it. Right off the bat I can say that I like what I'm seeing here. The things that the first issue sets up is not only the impact that the Green Lanterns have had on this universe, but the consequences of them having to leave theirs. Specifically them being cut off from their Power Rings power source, and now they're starting to run out of juice. Star Trek and comic crossovers haven't always worked. The ones with the X-Men springs to mind, but this one does. It probably helps that it's the Kelvin timeline, not the Prime timeline. I think it works because this universe is more action oriented and that works with comic books. Trinity number four, written by Francis Manipal and art by Emanuela Lupacino. It seems that I have a soft spot for Wonder Woman's origin, as this is my favorite issue so far of the three issues where the protagonists are under the influence of the Black Mercy. Though I must say that the events unfolding in the real world are painfully stretched out. I wonder if even five minutes have passed in the real world over the last three issues. With that comes the problem that we are no closer to finding out what the purpose for the villain to have done this is, and why Poison Ivy of all people is working with him. Batman number 13, written by Tom King and art by Michael Janine. I'll give this issue one thing. It made the inclusion of the ventriloquist on the team make sense. Not the rest of the plan, but at least that part made sense. What this story has accomplished is to awkwardly tell a pretty standard heist plot, except that I don't really see any reason for the complicated plan, other than to mislead the audience. It doesn't really do anything to further the goal. And there are not really any surprises. The twist was what anyone with half a brain could have seen coming miles away. Superman number 13, written by Peter Tomasi and Patrick Gleason, and art by Doug Mankey. 
This wasn't for me. This was for people who have had an investment in the Frankenstein's monster character and his backstory. As I don't have that, this did nothing for me, and it didn't interest me in discovering more about him and his woes. Other than that, I don't want to be too harsh on it. It was a two issue short, and that was mostly about this character and his ex wife. If you care about that, this might have been decent. It's hard to tell. So that was what I read this week. Did you enjoy this video? Please like, comment, subscribe and share this video. If you did not enjoy it or disagree with me, please let me know in the comments. And that was it for me for this week.